plain sight, the exhibition is in the one gallery, Gallery 21, but we've structured it to follow a broadly chronological approach. So when you're in here, you'll see the time is mapped out to follow the timeline, but we can break away from those points at any stage and come and look at objects close up. So each of the chronological sections is sort of marked off with these coloured paddles and they go from 1400 right through to 1900 and then we've tried to sort of put objects that connected with that part of the story. So here we'll have the very beginnings um, of the transatlantic slave trade and the origins and how we've, we've made a point of looking at how there were cultures in the Caribbean and in Africa before the Europeans were making these journeys. And each section then will cover a, a, a different narrative with different collections of objects. So moving on, the next phase allows us to explore what sometimes gets called the Middle Passage, we've called it Crossing the Atlantic, and, and so on around the gallery. So this would be timeline entries as well as commentary in the big text panels. So, in the same way, the period 1650 to 1700 is marked by the, um, the uprights and this section we've focused on plantation life and um, the conditions in which enslaved people were kept and worked and drawing attention to what it was that was so much at the heart of this um, cruel process which was to bring sugar over to Exeter and the next collection of objects allows us to explore that further. In this group of objects which is what we've called a cluster in, in the centre of the gallery you've got several clusters of objects that sort of enhance the narrative that you're seeing on their outside walls um, and these are all objects from Ram's collections connected with the trade in sugar so obviously very fine silverware um, was traded in Exeter and it was a golden age for um, goldsmiths in Exeter with sugar casters, hot chocolate using sugar, coffee using sugar, tea using sugar and so these are some examples of, from the collections but equally coffee houses such as Moles Coffee House which is in Exeter as well are places where these um, uh, imported goods such as tea and coffee and chocolate would be enjoyed possibly with rum from the sugar trade possibly with tobacco from the Virginia um, tobacco fields so the economy around slave enslaved people around the slave trade um, is very visibly evident in the objects that we have here so the next section in the chronology is the 1700 to 1800 period and this is we've kind of given quite a bit of focus to this section at first we wanted to draw attention to the resistance and rebellions that took place um, and how many so there were so many that we couldn't put them all on the timeline where we've put significant dates so we've created a map that just shows the dates of all the uprisings expressions of resistance um, that took place and then Moving to the next part of the gallery, we've really focused in on our unnamed Africans. This section of the gallery allows us to explore our own portrait of an African, which is called that because nobody really knows for sure who the sitter is, nor do we know who the artist is. And it also allows us to look at the unnamed Africans who were present in Britain in the 18th century, such as the figure that we see on the Coombe Satchfield textile, the embroidered figure of a servant holding a parasol over a very elegant lady. And this piece of material is just one small section of some very big drapes. We don't quite know what they were for, but they um, have got local scenes, church scenes, scenes from farming, and as I say, this one figure of, of a servant, as they would have called them at the time, uh, working as a parasol holder.
This section looks at the profits that were made in Britain out of the slave trading process. From 1730, Britain was the biggest slave trading country involved in transatlantic slave trade. And it wasn't a straightforward um, trade triangle, but as this map shows, there were many goods that were moving to and fro, and it created an enormous amount of wealth. The timeline continues, and as in each of the other sections, takes us through with more detailed events in this period up to 1800. So this is the final section of the chronological part of the show um, and it brings us up to 1900 and the last part of the um, text talks about how in order to bring abolition huge amounts of compensation were paid to people who had been involved in plantations and so this last bit of the exhibition allows you to see where we've got the database that covers um, the compensation records that were recently made digitised and so people can find out a lot more about this history now and which families in Devon, some of whom are, are visible here, there were plenty of others but we've focused on Devon families connected um, with the research that was done by our researchers from the Legacies of Devon Slavery Group um, to bring this part of the story to a close and before we move into the present day. So having got to um, 1900, we don't want to end the story there. The legacy of transatlantic slave trade obviously is still alive today. And we've worked with some of our local community who've very kindly given us their thoughts and their responses, their reflections on the transatlantic slave trade, what it means to them, and what the exhibition has um, stimulated. So those thoughts are recorded in a short film, which is also here in the exhibition and on the website. So this is the reflection area. Um, we felt all along that because the subject matter is quite painful or can be emotive, it would be useful to have a space where people can just withdraw for a few minutes to reflect or think about their responses. If they want to give us a written response, there's a feedback um, place for people to write something down and let us know or just talk about what they've been feeling in response to the exhibition. Um, and it's a quiet place just to mull over maybe or take stock. So the section here is about the resources that we used to build the exhibition and um, to share further ideas because an awful lot of research was done in preparation for this show, not all of which is on the walls or in the labels of the objects, but it is all available and can be researched in greater detail through the RAM website. Uh, where all the documents are available, but also resources that we found and large print captions for anyone who needs those while going around the gallery itself. As well as having the film by local contributors and um, the a film about the portrait of an African. We've also got a contemporary voice here through the artist Joy Gregory, who's responded to the themes, to her research when she's done trips to Exeter and Devon, um, looking at our collections and looking at the historical uh, situation around Topsham and Exeter. And her, te her textile piece that she's done in response to all of this it's called The Sweetest Thing, and therefore you can tell immediately that it's connecting us back up to the sugar items that we looked at um, earlier, the silver items and the sugar sherds. It also connects us to that tapestry or te embroidered textile that we saw from Coombe Satchfield and um, other imagery that you would see around on the walls in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. 
So Joy's work um, is the final piece on the going around the gallery in a sort of chronological order, but obviously uh, a visitor can break off at any point to look at the other displays in the centre of the room. We've looked at the sugar already, the sugar cluster, there's material on cotton, um, two sets of objects from Africa and the um, collection that we've presented from our first curator William Durban. So at any point the visitor can go and look at those. We've also got material of John Sweet's, the paintings and the documents from the Devon Record Office, uh, which kind of bring the whole story together. But that's the structure of the show, which I hope just helps to give you a bit of an idea about how it hangs together. <laughs>